Understanding power dynamics in society is nigh impossible, at least within such a structure, as it limits one's perspective. While comprehending the idea of supervisor and underling, moneyed versus poor, and badged versus private individuals seems generally self-evident, questioning these structures' existence, morality, and legitimacy is often frowned upon or even scoffed at, as supposedly without these structures, society itself would collapse. By its very inception, those outside the system are deemed immoral deviants, inherently creating that boundary of those within and those without. And seeing others go against the grain instills a deep-seated disdain within us humans, as they're breaking the social contract that we all signed, regardless of harm. As such, the moral question is pushed off the individual and carried by the enshrined system society elects to follow, entrusting a great amount of power into a few. This brings me to Akudama Drive and the notion of government's corruption and anarchism. Akudama Drive portrays a dystopian world strictly controlled by an all-powerful overarching system of government enacting authoritarian policies. After a civil war in Japan where Kansai and Kanto fought, the Kyoto vs Tokyo regions respectively, mind you, the Kanto region won out by dropping an experimental weapon on the Kansai region. This is incredibly reminiscent of the nuclear warhead detonated on Japan during World War II, so the parallel isn't lost. Aside from already leaning heavily on the imagery of the fallout in the wasteland from the two bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the victor of the war, Kanto, turns the loser, Kansai, into a vassal state, drawing on the post-war imagery of the Japanese occupation by America after World War II which led to an increase of factories for commodity production, with the US being the primary market in the recovery years. The parallel there being Kansai's main purpose in Akudama Drive is to support the Kanto region by producing for them. Specialty items like high-grade military technology and luxury goods are made in factories in Kansai, becoming the entire economy there. This sets up a massive dependency, where without Kanto using Kansai to produce items, people would be out of work with massive unemployment. The main character of the series, an ordinary girl who works for the system, gets roped into the life of a high-tier criminal by stumbling her way into a train heist to steal one such luxury item being delivered to Kanto. Threatened with her life, she has to go against the system she worked for, realizing the sacrifices it's built on, and choosing to do everything in her power to overthrow that system in the end. Is that easy for her? No. As the normalcy she's accustomed to is so ingrained, she can't leave it behind, as long as she believes there's a chance for her to return to it. Unfortunately, she's already labeled a criminal by that point, and immediately has to run away with no chance to explain her actions. It's only then she realizes how bad the police are, willing to hand children over to the state as a sacrifice with little care for their own citizens. She uses her new status as a criminal to throw society into chaos eventually leading the people in revolt against the police. But where this is easily read as a civilian leading a revolt against a corrupt government, the message here is deeper than that, as the government in this series is functioning. People have work, make money, live their lives easily, are typically carefree, and are happy outside the criminal element. This tells us that the system works. On the surface, it's a perfectly functioning government, meeting the population's general needs. But something is off. And that's the mostly robotic police force quickly processing people for petty crimes, dishing out fines, and jail time. The fear of the criminal element in Kansai tells us that there are those who are falling through the gaps of the system, either from boredom, lack of challenge, fulfillment, aesthetics, and even money. Most of which are higher on Maslow's hierarchy of needs than what typically motivates criminals showing us that these aren't struggles of basic needs, but of social rut. Akudama have their basic needs met, but they're committing crimes to fulfill their psychological needs, their self-fulfillment needs, what we generally consider gives our lives meaning. That sets out the motivations of the core cast, giving us an insight to the society they live in. The ever-present military occupation, highly active police force busting small crimes, and the executioners in the series allowed to enact deadly force on anyone listed as an Akudama, regardless of their circumstances, shows us a government stifling its citizenry not to the point of suffering, but to the point they work, get their jobs done, and nothing else. 
Massive displays of force are used on even small-time criminals to send a clear message, spun to ensure that the government maintains its authority and monopoly on violence. The people killed are criminals, because they wouldn't kill non-criminals. So clearly they're keeping the population safe, right? Kanto doesn't want free thinkers in their working population. They want supplies. Which finally leads me into the concept of anarchy and how it relates to this series. As a political ideology, anarchism is generally skeptical of authority, especially the state's monopoly on authority, as it's the one entity we implicitly condone to use violence on its own population. No one in this series bats an eye at the executioners killing Akudama, until they're seen killing one who appears to be a normal person. Thus it calls for the abolition of the state, or in other words, the system enacting that violence. There's a point in this series that resonates with the recent protests around the United States with civil unrest at a fever pitch, with the anger and frustration of that civil unrest aimed at the state's enforcers of violence, the police. We see that here, when a video of a seemingly normal person brutally murdered by the executioners goes viral. The media, in turn, churns that anger and sends those protesters to the seat of power to revoke the authority they gave by force if necessary. This isn't portrayed negatively, but as the emancipation movement of an oppressed citizen population taking back their city from the criminal boogeymen and the state that held them so tight under their boot. It was always about emancipation in this series, and the core cast hints that that's why they're fighting too. Freedom from the past, their criminal record, their own limits, and even their boredom. Told through the lens of struggle, we come to understand the plight of those who work for a living and those who fought to live. And that's what makes this series so remarkable. It wasn't that it was a simple heist story escalating into overturning a corrupt government, but a story about liberation of a population who didn't realize they were oppressed by a heavily militaristic government. People who needed to be made aware of how bad their situation was, as they turned a blind eye to the authorities they entrusted that power with for a modicum of security sedated into a place of complacency because they had a menace to fear and a peace of mind that it wasn't them. Revolution isn't always violent, but this is a case to show you that you may not be as happy, secure, and free as you believe. If you're not willing to challenge the unnoticed elements of your world and examine the structures of your society, how are you sure you're not just some tool in some larger machine stifling your own freedom? Hey, you made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, share, and do all the other YouTube stuff to help the channel grow. You can also join my Discord with the link down in the description. And if you really want to support me, you can head on over to my Patreon and pick up some extra perks, like voting on what I do next. Thanks for watching.